So uh, thank you everyone for being here. We're really excited to be at DEF CON. This is my second time. Thomas is his first. Uh, and it's, it's amazing to be uh, around people who care about security and sharing uh, information. So our talk today is about uh, malicious CDNs. And we're going to cover one particular one. I mean, there aren't many. But Zbot has been uh, an interesting fast flex proxy network in the past few years. And we're going to show how we have been studying it uh, using like SSL scans and combining like a few interesting heuristics that uh, use graph theory and uh, some statistics, basic. Hi, so uh, my name is Thomas Matthew, and uh, I'm a researcher at uh, Cisco Umbrella, which was formerly OpenDNS. And my main focus is on uh, data science and machine learning. And I'm Dia, so I'm the head of security research at uh, Cisco Umbrella, and my interests are in graph theory and security uh, overall. So what are we talking about today? Uh, just a quick overview or a few words about CDNs. Most of us know about them. These are like a, a very interesting and powerful technology that enables uh, people who have content, especially popular sites, to deliver their content uh, in an efficient way so then people around the world can get the content with low laten latency based on the edge nodes that are closer to these uh, users. So. For the sake of the stock, uh, certain features or requirements of a CDN infrastructure are of a particular interest to us. So specifically, that the uh, content of a customer will be delivered uh, with low latency. The customer's website will also be protected against DDoS attacks. The customers also try to hide their origin IP behind the CDN infrastructure. And then if uh, the site is uh, communicating via HTTPS, then you can, you can also have SSL certs deployed on the edge nodes. Uh, so then you, com you can guarantee that end-to-end -end, uh, secure comm. Now, most of us know about the legit ones, so Akamai, Cloudflare, Google Cloud, Amazon CloudFront. Cloudflare tends to be abused uh, uh, a few times by some uh, kind of bad content. But they are on the legit side, and we work with them to kind of uh, mitigate some of these uh, threats. But then there are like some pure criminal uh, content delivery networks here. They're more on the reverse proxy fast flux network side, and Zbot is one of them. In fact, we've been studying this network uh, for the past few years. We've had a talk at Black Hat 2014, 2016, and BotConf. And I invite you to go check like the details on how to detect it and uh, some of the other uh, features of the infrastructure. So this is kind of an overview of how uh, this network operates. So you have, in fact, around 30 to 40,000 uh, uh, compromised machines, mainly routers and access points in Ukraine and Russia. And they are maintained and harvested by uh, the actors. So it's not necessarily the guy who is selling the service in the underground the same as the ones who are uh, basically compromising the machines. Usually you can buy installs for thousands of machines, and then you can go and provision them to your customers. So as we know, like there's this big segmentation of uh, expertise in the underground. And then what you do is the, this actor will offer them in the underground in terms of uh, fast flux. So then as a customer, let's say you are willing to deliver, uh, you know, like malware, ransomware sites, uh, phishing, especially, uh, and we also saw a lot of these carding and cybercrime forums, cybercrime forums, who will switch between these infrastructures to protect the content so it's not taken down, so it's not revealed uh, to security researchers, etc. And in that case, what they do is they hide behind the Zbot uh, CDN or Fast Flux Proxy Network. And when they buy the service for a couple hundred dollars, or I would say in that range, then you will get, uh, you'll be provisioned if, I would say between 40 to 50, sometimes it goes up, but it's in that range, a uh, number of IPs or bots that on which you'll be having your SSL uh, installed. And that way, you will guarantee that the end-to-end -end communication from the victims talking to ransomware C2s, crime or consumers, or researchers like us will be talking HTTPS to the end-to-end. Uh, -end. So this is kind of an interesting infrastructure, in fact. It's been around for years, and uh, it's worth investigating from the SSL perspective, as we said, because all of the bots will have SSL uh, certs installed on, the, installed on them. And when you have like scans, you can uh, figure out a lot of interesting patterns. Quickly, I mentioned crime forums, dump shops, malware. These are like just screen screenshots that you can find uh, anywhere on the web. And I guess quickly, as the cert, as we know, it will have this section called common name or, or a field, which has to match the domain you're trying to protect with HTTPS. Uh, 
uh, obviously I will not get to get into details where you can have like wild cards and subdomains and stuff like that. But then the main point is that, like we said, if you want to protect your site end to end, then you'll have to have your cert of the, let's say, crime or forums form deployed on the bots that you got provisioned so then they can uh, deliver your content with uh, SSL encryption. So uh, the, the main objective in today's talk is to provide researchers with a series of statistical tools that can allow them to analyze uh, large sets of SSL data. And uh, all of the data that we're going to be discussing in today's talk is actually uh, available uh, at the following URL, and it's collected by uh, Rapid7 and the University of Michigan. So this is a high-level uh, overview of kind of how the, the talk is kind of going to go. You're going to discuss what exactly is contained in the SSL sonar data. And then once we do that, we can then model that data using a bipartite graph, which splits the, uh, the data into uh, common names and then ASNs. Once we have that bipartite graph, we can then start co collecting kind of what we call global information through a series of histograms that uh, calculate the relative frequencies of the popularity of both ASNs and domains. Uh, these histograms then allow us to create uh, micro-local features at, at a per-domain basis. And then once we have those tiny histograms, we can use a, a bucketing scheme to convert them into a vector. And then this vector can then be measured against other domains in the same kind of neighborhood of popularity in the graph. And then ultimately, we can then use uh, just like a very simple anomaly detection mechanism to see whether a domain in a particular neighborhood is unlike its other neighbors. And that's how we can identify whether a domain is potentially a, a Zbot host. So with SSL, we don't really need to dig into the, de uh, into the, the details too much. We just kind of know that SSL is a secure socket layer. It's used for uh, encrypting traffic over HTTP. And there's just been an increase in websites uh, employing uh, SSL. And the type of SSL data that we're working with is the X509 certificate. And the X509 certificate contains uh, information regarding the issuer as well as the subject. And for today's talk, we're more interested in the subject, that is the person who the SSL certificate belongs to. And in particular, when we're looking at the subject information, we're interested in a field that Dia mentioned that's called a common name. Now, a common name can be any alphanumeric string. But in particular, we're interested in common names that are uh, legitimate domain names. And that's because we want to see what are the domain names that are associated with a particular X509 certificate. So this is just uh, an example of how an X509 certificate looks if you uh, decode the uh, base64. And one of the useful things about uh, SSL data is that it allows us to map out not only residential IPs versus commercial IP space, but also allows us to uh, understand where a network can be uh, spread out over a, a series of IPs. So let's say we have a, a set of X509 certificates and their corresponding IPs. If we look at the common name information, we can see how a particular uh, common name is spread out over a series of IPs. And then we can make a guess that that common name entity is somehow involved in some way with the uh, hosting or the co-location at that IP. And so with sonar data, uh, it's, it's about a twice or four times monthly scan over the entire IPv4 space. But in actuality, because certain network operators don't allow the University of Michigan to uh, scan their IP range, we don't get information from certain ranges. And it's just a basic scan on port 443. And then uh, the most important part is we have an X509, X509 certificate as well as information regarding the IP that it was found on. And this is kind of the flow chart that we used uh, in order to kind of get our data prepped before we perform the analysis. We take a, a raw monthly scan of sonar data, we then extract out the common names, and then we map uh, an IP to an ASN. And then we come up with this uh, kind of quadruple, which is the SSL SHA, the IP, the common name, and then the ASN that the IP belongs to. And what's really get great about the sonar study is uh, because this is at, produced on a monthly basis, we can kind of see how hosting patterns emerge and change over a five-month period. So real quick here, what we can see is the range of, uh, I would say, number of SHAs we collect every month. So we can see that between 250K and a million unique SHAs during a five-month period, 
And then from those, obviously, the, the data also has the, uh, the raw search, so you can decode it and then extract the common name. So the point here is that we have a, a quite a big enough, uh, I would say, a data set that allows us to uh, try to find some interesting patterns and find these anomalies and, uh, I would say, threats in general. And the other thing is that it's difficult to manually inspect these domains. That's why you are looking, we're looking for a large-scale abstraction model that can help us uh, do these kind of analytics. And in a sense, graphs, as you know, are very useful to do a lot of things. So uh, most of you know about bipartite graphs. You have like two sets that are disjoint. And in this case, we took like a simple representation where you have a common name set connected to the ASNs which means the common name is hosted on an IP, but then that IP belongs to an ASN. And we found that by uh, lumping all of the IPs within in the ASN node, that's more useful for our investigation than keeping the CN to IP bipartite graph. And that's basically what you end up having. Uh, this has been useful to do the, the type of analysis that we're gonna describe uh, in a second. So I guess the first takeaway is that the bipartite graph is a useful representation of uh, this problem that helped us uh, solve some of the uh, uh, issues. So classically, there are multiple methods for uh, analyzing a graph and kind of figuring out uh, or identifying various substructures. One is uh, you can use a graph factorization technique, or you can identify the various connected components within the graph and then study each of those connected components or kind of calculate the minimum spanning trees. Uh, for this talk, we're actually not going to use any of those three methods. We're instead going to be looking at a, a, another set of statistics. But in general, our goal is to identify uh, possibly anomalous substructures within the graph. And so a substructure within the graph can be thought of as a certain set of domains and ASNs that have some sort of odd shape. And I know that sounds slightly vague right now, but as the talk goes forward, you'll start to see what we mean by a substructure uh, within the graph. Uh, so when we are analyzing the graph, we need to come up first with a, a baseline metric of what we can consider a normal. And so what it, we wanted to do was create a, a metric that is based on the topological features of the graph. That means we're looking at somehow the relationship between uh, domains and their mapping to ASNs and vice versa. Now, uh, a really easy way to do that is to kind of just look at the popularity of each common name. And so the popularity of each common name becomes defined as the, essentially the degree count at each domain vertex. And so we then calculate the frequencies of how a particular domain name is, dis is distributed across a set of ASNs. And then for each ASN, we model that ASN as having a particular type. And now the type of the ASN is referred to its uh, popularity. And the popularity of the ASN is how many unique common names uh, appear on it. So there's like this type of weird mirror relationship between the two uh, popularity scores that we create. And so Dio now will kind of show with a simple example how this works. So let's break it down here in, in a, like a very simple example. So we see our common name, uh, I would say red set, linking to the other set of the bipartite graph, which is the ASNs in blue. And uh, the nice analogy we're going to use in the stock is common names take them as people, individuals, and the ASNs are basically cities or states. And you can see that, let's say, a person like John at the top, he lived in, let's say, one, two, three, four, four cities, which are four ASNs, or he lived in four different states. And what we try to do here is to study the the uh, the ASN part. So in, in a sense, you're looking at the uh, behavior of cities in terms of how many people they hosted. So what we have here is that the ASN at the top, the blue one, has three incident edges, which means uh, it has a degree of three, and it had three common names hosted on it. And you look at the other uh, uh, follower uh, following like ASNs, the second one has an incident, uh, one incident uh, edge, which means it has a degree of one. Anyhow, so what you end up having is like the three bullets at the bottom where you have two occurrences of an ASN with degree one, three occurrences of an ASN with degree two, and two occurrences of a degree uh, three. And the simplified histogram at the bottom, you can see ASN degree on the X, number of occurrences of that event on the Y. And that's how you can scale that to a bigger data set. So when we apply then this technique to the uh, entire January data set of around 22,000 ASNs, uh, the histogram on the right 
uh, is a sampling, a stratified sampling from a, a set now of 5K. And what we notice is that there's a definite kind of long tail to this uh, to this distribution. So the majority of the ASNs are kind of lumped in the zero to five range, as you can see what's being circled. But then there are a couple ASNs way out to the right that host more than 50,000 unique uh, domain names. And yeah, like the quick takeaway is that, uh, as Thomas said, the majority of the ASNs are basically hosting between one and a hundred domains. In a sense, the majority of cities in the US, for example, are hosting between one and a hundred uh, people, just to use the analogy. So here are some kind of numbers, uh, some raw numbers that kind of back up that, that statistic. So if you look at the number of ASNs hosting just one uh, unique common name, it's around 7,600. Then the number of ASNs hosting two common names, it's a uh, little under 4,000. And then if you look at the number of ASNs just hosting under 20 unique common names, it's 19,000. So that's more than 97% of all uh, ASNs kind of fall within that uh, 20 unique uh, common name band. And of course, ASNs hosting more than 100 are uh, only, only less than 1,000. So let's take the mirror set now, the common names, which are, let's say, the people or individuals. So in a sense, you're trying to figure out some, uh, some behavior or like some uh, better understanding. So in here, we can see that the first red dot has one, two, three, four outgoing edges. So it has a degree of four. This next one has five. Um, outgoing edges, so a degree of five, and you end up having that list of, uh, I would say, events. So two times we have a common name with degree one, et cetera, et cetera, and you end up constructing that histogram at the bottom where you have like the common name degrees on the X and the number of times that event uh, happened in terms of uh, degree value. So what happens when we apply then this metric to the global data set? Well, out of around uh, 850,000 domains, we again did a, a sampling to kind of represent it on the histogram. And we can see again that there's a, a very close clustering towards the 1 to 200 uh, range. And we can kind of see this if we zoom in. Uh, that's the bottom histogram where we can see the majority of uh, common names mapped to say 1 to 3 uh, unique ASNs, and then there's a very short, sharp drop-off, and you get ticks at essentially every other uh, kind of count in between 1 to 100, 140. And so let's now just take a really quick, quick look at the outliers. So uh, you can see that one of the outliers is D-Link, and the other one is uh, Google Video, both domains that people are pretty familiar with, and they're definitely not malicious. Yeah, like the quick uh, takeaway I would say is that Google Video, as we see, is found on, as a common name, is found on 2,000 different ASNs. That's basically the common name you'll find uh, on the search that are used for uh, YouTube uh, content delivery. Obviously, Google has deployed a lot of, uh, I would say, caching mechanisms on edge nodes around the world. So that's why you'll see this big diversity of ASNs for Google Video. So Google Video is not a fast flux. It's just like a, a core uh, CDN, uh, I would say, um, common name you find on the search that are serving the content. So uh, the, I guess the one other point to just kind of mention is that there's a, an exponential kind of drop off when it comes to how uh, domain counts are distributed uh, across ASN. So you can see the, the jump from Synology to example and then example to D-Link and then D-Link to a Apple iTunes is very rapid which uh, kind of just shows how quickly everything starts to converge towards uh, these extremely t towards common names that map to very few ASNs. And so why are we kind of talking about all of this and kind of doing all these histograms? Well, the goal of this talk is to find kind of substructures uh, within the graph. And so as we know that as we move towards the right of uh, this graph and we start to see how an ASN, so I'm sorry, a common name maps to more and more ASNs, we gain more information about that uh, common name. So for example, when we know that an ASN map, a common name maps to say a thousand ASNs, it's very easy to understand possibly what that uh, common name's behavior or role is. But as we move towards say an ASN, I'm uh, sorry, a common name that maps to only one, uh, one ASN, it's very difficult to understand what's going on. So uh, what we can then see is that around 97% of all domains uh, just mapped to a single ASN. 
And the problem here then is that in that range of one to 10 mappings, there's just not enough information to kind of make any type of inference. Quick thought here is that uh, in general, if you're trying to do data analysis, uh, data is useful, but then if uh, the data is too sparse, there's no chance to find anything interesting. And if the data is, let's say Google Video and D-Link, they're like so popular that you are not expecting to find anything useful. That's why here we kind of focus, like Thomas said, on a very small range that we believe has the core or the essence, the essence of some of the interesting patterns we're trying to track. And in general, we could have taken like a clustering approach because this is, this is kind of an unsupervised method on this big data set. But then we found that using like some simple statistical uh, techniques like histograms is very uh, good to find like the, uh, to get like b build this understanding step by step of the data you're looking at. So you're trying to isolate your focus on specific regions that then you can go and like peel them off with other techniques. So uh, with the following kind of information that we just kind of discussed, it's very easy to come up with a, a simple heuristic to filter out 99% of all the domains. We just remove or we just don't look at domains that map to fewer or more than uh, 10 different ASNs. And to kind of expand, again, it's, it's kind of like when you're analyzing a document. If a document only has a single word or a couple of words, it's very difficult to know whether that document was just created by some random process, somebody just kind of typing it out, a word, and then spitting out that document. But as the document increases in size, it's potentially a lot easier to find some sort of topic within the document. So the goal here is to kind of find the topic of a, a domain. We want to see kind of how the domain is deployed within this larger ASN uh, structure. And in particular, we're trying to understand whether that topic can be considered malicious. So We've talked a lot about kind of the macro level of the graph, but we haven't talked that much about the micro level. And so the micro level is understanding how a particular domain is mapped to a set of ASNs. So the two histograms right here uh, kind of give uh, frequency counts at a domain uh, level. So the x-axis denotes the type of ASN. And just as a refresher, the type of ASN uh, means how many other domains are, are mapped to that ASN. And then the y-axis represents the frequency of that type of ASN for the particular domain. So if you look at the top uh, histogram for a Narana market, we can see that it contains one ASN that is extremely popular. So this uh, ASN hosts more than uh, 25K other unique uh, domains. And then it has a concentration of ASNs that are hosting at least a thousand other unique uh, domains. And that's kind of where its general kind of mass density is concentrated. But if you look at Minuscu and its ASN frequencies, we notice that the ASN that contains the most uh, or hosts the most other domains is only a little under 2,000. And then the majority of its ASNs that it's found on are only hosting one or five other unique domain names. So there's clearly a, a difference in how these two uh, domains are distributed. To bring back the analogy of earlier, so uh, I guess that people living in cities or states, like Nara and Mark Market, think about this, that as, let's say, John. And John happens to have lived on uh, one single city that had 25,000 people in it, but most of the time he lived in cities that had between zero and, let's say, one and a thousand people. So you can see kind of the, how the sky is migrating between different cities. Similarly, for Min New Secure, it happened to have lived only on one city or ASN that had also re uh, like hosted uh, 1,500 plus other common names or people. But most of the time, the Minion Secure has kind of rotated around uh, cities or ASNs that were in that smaller range at the bottom. So these are like very lowly populated ASNs. And this, as we will see, is very interesting because it will tell you what's this common name used for depending on uh, how, where is it being, res where is it residing and how is it moving around on the ASN ecosystem. So I understand that pictures can sometimes be a little bit confusing, especially at the resolutional scales that I've had them at. So hopefully this kind of numeric information can kind of further highlight what we were discussing. We can see that for Minuscu, uh, the ASNs that it's hosted on are all ASNs that just host one, two, or three other unique uh, domain names. While for uh, Narana Market, there's not a single ASN that hosts uh, less than a thousand 
other unique domain names. So with kind of this general intuition, it's only natural to ask, how can we come up with a mechanism to determine how far apart or how different uh, Narayana Market and uh, Munisku are? Real quick, in fact, this one, the mean secure is part of Zbot. So having that interesting pattern will be uh, highlighted later. And we were able to find it with an unsupervised method. So uh, as I mentioned, you, you can't directly compare uh, these two histograms because they're on completely different scales. Uh, Munisku is only having counts under 1,000, essentially. And uh, Narana Market is having counts over 1,000. So we need some sort of representation of the entire spectrum of possible uh, domain ASN counts uh, to kind of be created. And so this object will be unique per domain. And then we can use this kind of vector as a mechanism to determine similarity. And so in order to create this vector, we need to have a, a bucketing scheme, which maps certain regions of counts to a particular dimension within that vector. And so in this case, we're interested in domains that might be mapped to a variety of different ASNs, but the ASNs that they're mapped to are actually quite unpopular. So what we're looking for, what we're most interested in, are then uh, ASNs that are at a very low frequency. And as a result, we then create a bucketing scheme that is incredibly sensitive to low frequencies. Uh, the best way to think about this is perhaps in a picture. Let's say you're interested in a certain color. Uh, then you devise a filter that essentially blocks out other colors and then kind of just focuses either on the gray colors or the purples. In the same way, you can think of the distribution of uh, domain uh, ASN distribution as kind of belonging to colors. So like low frequencies are more like blues, high frequencies are more like reds, and we care more about blues. So as a result, when we bucket uh, the histogram, per domain, we bucket it into nine different bands, and each band refers to a kind of an index of popularity. So we have a band that's uh, counting the number of ASNs that map to 1 and 5, 5 and 10, 10 and 20. But then as we go larger, we increase the size of each bucket. So that means that, for example, all the uh, numbers that range between 1,000 and 4,000 will all be mapped to the same bucket in the, in the vector. And so, again, this allows us to have a much better uh, resolution of understanding how a domain is mapped to lower frequency uh, ASNs. And I, if this has become a little bit, com if I kind of messed up the explanation, this slide kind of gives a really nice uh, pictorial representation. Yeah. So, if we look here, we can see mean CQ, and it has that long, uh, I would say, uh, uh, table, or sorry, array. So the array, as we can see, it has all of these one one ones, And based on the bucketing that Thomas described, 1-5, we're basically counting how many numbers uh, are in the range of 1-5. So you can see 1-1-1 one, 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 all the way to 5. So that, that gives you like 15 occurrences of those numbers. And you cannot keep going. So you have the 5 to 10. You have basically five numbers occurring in that range. And that's how you build your vector for both the top domain and the bottom domain. And you can see that that way you can have these two vectors that will allow you to compare these two uh, uh, domains uh, in the same scale. Yeah, I guess just to, the takeaway three here is that the majority of domains we saw earlier are mapping or hosted or living on between 1 to 200 ASNs. And as Thomas said, we had to devise a bucketing that is sensitive to low popularity ASNs. In other words, you have like a variable variable resolution uh, depending on the lower, uh, I would say, bands of interest. Now, the next, the next step here is that we want to go back and focus on the common name and how many ASNs each domain maps to. And that will be like the next step that will lead us to uh, explain to you how we find these outliers and hence the Zbot domains within this very big data set. Okay. So we now are going to go back to the original list of uh, domains that were found in the X509 certificates. And so as we know, we can kind of filter out the mega outliers, the D-Links, the Googles, because we kind of already have a very good idea of what they are. And now what we want to do is come up with a mechanism to kind of create neighborhoods of domains. And in this case, a neighborhood of a domain is uh, other domains that share a very close 
uh, count in how many other ASNs they're mapped to. So for example, uh, on the picture, you can see that let's say we were looking at the list of domains that map to 160 to 150 different ASNs. Well, in that kind of neighborhood, you would have like iTunes.apple.com, uh, ASOS Media, download.mcafee.com. And so all of these domains we say belong to the same neighborhood because they all kind of map to the same amount of ASNs. So once we have a neighborhood, uh, we also have a histogram, a histogram vector that we created for each domain. And now this is where we can just apply a, a really simple pairwise Euclidean distance between any of these two domains using the domain's histogram. Real quick, like a quick analogy again is think about these bands as like income. So you have like people and they are in a band of income like 150, 160K. And you have like these cities with neighborhoods and you're trying to find people who are within a, how close are they to each other if they're making within that range of income. And you'll see later with Thomas that some of them will have some interesting outliers and they, they are maybe anomalous. They're making this much money, but maybe it's, there's something fishy about them. So this is a, a, hypo, uh, it's kind of a hypothetical distance matrix for a band or a neighborhood that contains only three domains, domain one, domain two, domain three. So uh, each cell, you can think of the value there is calculated by uh, calculating the distance between any two uh, domains. So let's just look at the red column. So uh, the distance between domain one in itself is naturally going to be zero, right? then the, uh, the distance between uh, domain 2 and domain 1 is also going to be some value. And then the distance between domain 3 and domain 1 is also going to be some value. And so what this means is that if I look at the red column, I can then see the distance between D1 and, ev and every other domain in its band. And uh, this naturally kind of means that if we want to find uh, domains that are very different from its neighbors, we just calculate the uh, Euclidean norm of each column of this, of this matrix. Uh, and that then allows us to kind of figure out uh, how different it is from its neighbor. And of course, the larger the value, that's going to mean that it's more different than its neighbors. So over the January uh, data set as a trial, we kind of ran this a while ago. And we had one really interesting case in the neighborhood of 100 to 110. And so... As you can see, the average in this band or in this neighborhood is around 128 or so. But there's one very clear outlier, which has an overall distance from its neighbors of around 567. And so in the histogram, you can see how the averages are all kind of bunched up in this really tall spike. And then you have these two outliers way out uh, at 400 and around 500. And just kind of really, it's, it's kind of, uh, it's, it's easy to kind of calculate the standard deviation then of these two, and then notice that they're, that they're uh, definitely two standard deviations away. And so what was great, well, when we ran this, we found this domain called tangerine-secure.com, which uh, through some kind of more further manual probing, uh, we were able to actually identify as a Zbot domain. But Zbot lives in other ranges as well. And so again, in the neighborhood of 30 to 40 different ASNs, we found a couple of other outliers. So in this case, uh, as the amount of kind of information decreases, right, because you're going from say 100, which is a lot more information to say like 30, the, the spectrum of possible distances increases, so it becomes a little bit noisier. But at the same time, if you look at the tail of the histogram, there's still in interesting domains. So the majority of the distances are kind of all, kind of all nicely lumped together. But then if you cross the 200 barrier, uh, the 200 distance mark, you can see that there are, couple, there are actually five domains. And uh, out of these five domains, uh, three actually turned out to be uh, malicious. So Minuscu, uh, Secure Data SSL, and Secure Tangerine And the, the kind of the further validation was done actually through some more passive DNS down the road and then some more active probing. Uh, and what's really good about this method is we were able to take a set of around 8,000, 800,000 domains and then reduce it to a far more kind of manageable set of around eight domains that we can inspect manually uh, by hand or give on to an analyst and also gain IP information. Like about the previous slide, the analogy you could think about also, you have all of these Zbot domains are trying to kind of hide within the large 
I would say, SSL, ASN, IP space ecosystem, and they're part of the same gang. However, you can see that some of them have lived in low to medium to high income, that, that's the analogy, and then with this method, you were able to find them uh, with all of that pipeline of, of macro, micro, distance measurement uh, calculation that we described to you. So I guess the a few final thoughts here is that when we found these this last list that was reduced from 8,000K to, uh, I would say, you know, less than 10, uh, we had to use some extra signals to verify the true positives and also weed out the false positives. And for that, we used some simple ones like how many uh, SHAs that does the common name map to? and also the uh, ratio between the IPs that the SHA was found on uh, to the uh, ASNs where those IPs uh, are living. And you can see that that ratio ha ha was very revealing to find all of the ZBOT domains like MinioCQ, the Secure Data SSL, and the Tangerine, they happen to have IP count over ASN count between one and two. In other words, actually that was confirmed uh, that confirms the uh, the business model of the actor behind Zbot, where when he sells you between 40 and 50 IPs, he will never give you uh, IPs that belong to uh, the same ASN. Usually, you will get like one IP per ASN, and he tries to diversify uh, the the offering that he gives to his uh, customers. Um, so yeah, this has been like very useful to find this actionable intelligence, so we can like block these domains or or further investigate them. Obviously, we have like some other systems to catch these uh, Zbot domains, but the whole exercise that we try to share with you is that you can start with like a very large data set and kind of try to peel it off by building this understanding from a macro, micro, and then as the intuitions kind of strengthen, you end up having like these interesting ways to uh, find like uh, reduce the set and have it. Um, manage, have it uh, to the scale where it's manageable uh, by hand or by uh, eyeballing. So I guess uh, just a quick comparison here. You have Secure Tangerine, which is Zbot, Blue Apron, which is a legit uh, domain, and they happen to ha live in the same neighborhood, like they're making between 30 and 40K uh, money-wise. Uh, the idea is that th they live in ASNs that have uh, actually, they, they are mapped they live in a neighborhood where the most people, most common names there are mapping to 30 to 40 ASNs. And for Tangerine, you can see that all of the ASNs we mentioned here are all like Ukrainian ISPs. Uh, it's basically residential, uh, you know, IPs that are either popped uh, routers or access points uh, that have been uh, leveraged for this infrastructure. Whereas Blue Apron is hosted on, even though it's in the same band, it's hosted on like your legit Akamai's and Orange and Amazon. So I guess the takeaways, I'll let Thomas go over those. Um, so I guess one of the big takeaways we took is you can use kind of the global structure of the ASN uh, domain name graph to help us inform decisions at the local level. And then there's also really kind of easy statistical tools that you can use to winnow down a pretty large data set into something that's far more uh, manageable. And what was kind of great about this is that we start off in January and then we kind of ran this approach uh, every month on the subsequent uh, kind of Sonar SSL feeds and started monitoring the, the IP space for the domains that we found. And Dia will kind of show some more uh, examples in, in the later months, like in April and June, of what else we found. So one more thought, actually, about the main takeaway. So you might think, okay, you spent all of this time to just catch like eight or three things. Uh, fair enough, but the exercise is useful because you could take this generic method and apply it on any other data set. So most of research is often is not about the problem itself that you're trying to solve. It's about the whole methodology and the mental exercise you go through it with your team and your peers. So that's why we felt like this might be useful for, you know, as a general thought process. So we could apply it on other data sets where you can basically represent the, the, the data as a bipartite graph of X to Y. Now, some bonus slides about the Zbot infrastructure itself. By studying SSL, we were seeing like some interesting uh, patterns. Actually, the slide got messed up there, unfortunately. But the top uh, like timeline shows this malware C2 domain that has a different way to operate with SSL than a the domain at the bottom, which is Private Zone WS, Private Zone WS, which is a known crime or forum. So at the top, you can see that uh, orospoo.cc was created on April of this year. The first DNS queries we saw in our traffic were four days later. Then it was hosted two days later on another bulletproof hosting infrastructure 
we call Alex that we actually covered on Thursday at Black Hat. And then on April 23rd, uh, there was a cert created that was then deployed on the Zbot FastFlux and the domain started being hosted on Zbot. So you can see here, as you want, as you buy the service, you're immediately provisioned with an SSL. Either you buy it yourself and you provide it to the actor he, and he will push it on the, on the machines, on the nodes, or he will do it for you. Similarly, for PrivateZone.ws, which is a known crime or forum for years, the domain was created like four years ago, like 2014, I would say. For a long time, it's been hiding behind Cloudflare, but actually it had an origin IP uh, that was unknown, let's say, unless you have other ways like SSL and passive DNS probing. But then over that period of Cloudflare protection, they were using a variety of SSLs uh, provisioned by Cloudflare. Then on May the 7th, 2017, they created a dedicated SSL cert. And then on May the 7th, the same day, they started being hosted on the Alex FastFlux infrastructure. Uh, and then on June 27th, now they became uh, hosted on the Zbot with the same old SSL. And finally on July the 19th, they created the second SSL and pushed it on the uh, edge nodes that are bought by the customer, which are around 40 to 50 machines in Ukraine and Russia. So what we're trying to show here is that it's kind of interesting to see how the actor uh, sets up his back-end infrastructure and how he maintains all of these uh, different like domain creation, SSL creation, hosting, change of SSLs, etc. I guess the final slide here is like the same one as we showed earlier, just like maybe to uh, kind of do a uh, bring it all together. So again, it's like a, an infrastructure that is... Uh, provided for customers to hide their content behind the scenes. You can have one SSL cert per domain, or you can have, uh, oftentimes actually, actually we saw, even if the bot is still holding the common name of a known uh, crime or forum, it doesn't prevent uh, any other domain to be, uh, uh, I would say, hosted or delivered through that IP. But in that case, it will not be using the SSL encryption because the, the domain of the new site will not match the common name of, let's say, private zone. So yeah, that was it. Thanks again for your attention and hopefully. <laughs> Questions? Uh, we just used uh, Python and Seaborn. Yeah, so you actually, what's kind of funny is you don't really need any fancy machine learning stuff. You just kind of got to use some basic stats and you find interesting stuff in the data. So, yeah, like uh, another thing, the, the, the whole uh, scans were pushed into HBase. That way we can kind of do the, the search at scale. But yeah, like Thomas said, it's mainly like... Uh, a lot of NumPy. Yeah. And like some, some good, uh, I would say, judgment and discussions with the team. Oh, uh, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, he asked whether we found anything interesting about the certificate authorities uh, for the SSL cert for like the, the domains that we're hosting uh, Zbot. Well, unfortunately, your typical uh, abused ones like the Commodo and Let's Encrypt, and I don't want to you know name names, but those are the ones you see a lot being used because either they offer like free certs or they have a lot of resellers. Usually you find a lot of these, uh, I would say, suspicious or bulletproof hosting providers who will offer you hosting plus SSL uh, cert. So it became like a very uh, like a very common commodity to get like a cert with the hosting uh, space. You're saying, did we use the same method to find some other botnets? Good question. So at the moment, Zbot happened, we, we are tracking other, uh, I would say, bulletproof hosting infrastructures that are, uh, I would say, distributed. But this one happens to be the only one that uses a CDN-like uh, structure. So the others, they will have certs, but they are deployed in only one or two domains. So as we saw, sorry, uh, IPs. So as we saw earlier, if the do information is too 
sparse, then there isn't much to find with this method. Then you'll, you're better off like using some other techniques that are much simpler and no need for like complicating your life basically. But okay, sorry. You meant DDoS command and control. We haven't. So that, that would be a, a good uh, discussion. We can talk. Yeah. Thank you. Well, Akamai were not a problem. Like we just said they were good and they were hosting like good stuff. It, it was, uh, yeah, it was a bunch of like residential people who actually were, I guess, unsuspectingly hosting a lot of, a lot of these guys. Akamai for the most part is actually uh, really, uh, have a clean network. Yeah, yeah like uh, the reminder is that the, most of these bot IPs are in Ukraine and Russia. So they're mostly residential ISPs that are being, I would say, abused. So yeah, Akamai was in the example that we showed that was a legit, clean, uh, uh, I would say, infrastructure. Thank you all.